in the first service they put up the name of this series that was moving forward but I felt sometimes before we move forward we have to go back to the starting blocks and look back so uh, this, this service I have permission to do that um, must be getting old when you reminisce you're getting on so love this church it rocks <laughs> On January the 21st, 1971, I was born again in a service, a sermon by Leo Harris, the founder of Christian Revival Crusade, which is now CRC Churches International. And it, the message was about hell, and it literally scared the hell out of me. <laughs> but it was also positive about the return of Christ and how to avoid hell. And uh, Leo was a teacher of such skill that he could teach on a negative subject like that and get people saved and uh, got me saved. So that was the start of my Christian walk. And I think when I reflect back on those days, my question is, have we lost something? Um, are we still carrying that spirit of revival? Is it still a crusade for us? Crusade's a bit of a no-no word. I don't like using it in Africa, but it is used commonly. But let's say an open-air outreach. New Guinea's got a better term. But I think, I trust that today we can pick something up of the past that we can then build on to move on into the future. Your future and the future here as a church. When I was saved January 21st, truly born again, lots of things fell off my life instantly. I've been trying to stop smoking for four years. I was coughing up blood. Um, think, you know, truly hooked on that stuff. Um, and yet, the, the morning after I received Christ, that was the end of it. Other things. At Easter 1971, or before then, I was baptised in water. In those days, you got born again, you get baptised in water, and then you get baptised in the Holy Spirit. And uh, that was at an Easter camp at Tatachilla. Um, down the south coast, which is actually a winery, but it was a Lutheran campsite. I got filled with the Spirit. Now, keep in mind, when I was born again, I was delivered from drink, using alcohol to just escape the world for a while. And we, they prayed for everyone to receive the Spirit down in a cellar. And that night, a wine vat burst. And I had to ask, now, which Spirit am I going to be filled with here? <laughs> it stunk. But I had a beautiful four-hour experience with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit the spirit with a capital S. And I never looked back. That, that was such a transforming thing in my life. And the other thing we did in those days, Norma was saved in 1968, same thing, say, baptised in water, filled the Holy Spirit. Then you went to Bible school, straight away. And in those days, it was amazing. I know farmers in Victoria who were born again like I was. They sold their farm instantly. One of them had five children sold their farm, people sold their businesses, they pulled out of study courses and came to Adelaide and went to um, Crusade Bible School. Teachers like Leo Harris, Ken Chant, Barry Chant, Dudley Cooper and others. It was an amazing time and it got us grounded in the word. We were so hungry for God's word. I got a B and Pastor Bill Vazalakis got a C, I'll just mention that. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> That's the only thing I got ahead of him, I can tell you. <laughs> and he's taller. <laughs> but um, so those were the, that, that was the culture of CRC in those days. Um, you got saved. You got baptised. You were baptised in the Spirit. Sometimes the last two were the other way around. Then you did Bible school. And that was 18 months, four nights a week, two and a half hours a night, and after a day's work and everything else, and ministering in the church on weekends, that's a big week. But people did it cheerfully, joyfully. Barry Chant did a survey some years ago on what's happened to all the students that went through that Bible school. And he found that 80% were in full-time ministry. So something was very efficient. I like things efficient, don't you? If I buy a car, I don't want a Ford. I want a Toyota or a Holden or something, you know, and... <laughs> If I barrack for footy team, I'll barrack for... Well, I'll be quiet on that one. <laughs> so, them were the days. So, today, um, we're going to look at uh, some scriptures um, 
in Nehemiah chapter 4. And um, the first section of verses, I'm, I've called it the Sanballat spirit. Sanballat was a leader of uh, a chunk of the army of Samaria. And um, at this stage in history, Israel was in captivity in Persia. And um, they'd been, under a decree, able to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of their precious, much-loved temple, which was lying in ruins. And so we'll take up the story. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria... He said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Now, Nehemiah was called Nehi for a reason. Okay, intimidation tends to make us feel very small. You know, young people, oh, when you're mature, when you grow up. But hang on, I've been a kids pastor for 20 years in this place. I've seen kids in Africa and other nations, and I tell you, I think they're, they're the mature ones in God sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes we need to learn from a kid. Jesus said that's a good idea. Unless you become as a little child, you not see the kingdom of heaven. So intimidation was happening here. What are those feeble Jews doing? Who will restore? Will they restore their wealth? Will, will they offer sacrifices? Man, this place was built on some sacrifices, I can tell you. Especially me when I nearly fell from eight metres of scaffolding down here one day. We were painting the ceiling and the scaffolding was up, I'm walking along, and I didn't know that the, ce- that the ceiling fixes pulled out two square metres of scaffolding without telling anyone, and I'm going along, and I feel, <laughs> luckily I felt that, that I was on the way down. So I tell you, this place has come through prayers and blood, sweat, and tears. I told in the first service, I remember before the roof went on, this used to fill up every winter. Unfortunately, it was two or three winters before the roof went on, with water. So I thought we were opening a sauna or a swimming pool or something. But the ducks really enjoyed it. But eventually, it came, eventually we're at this point today. Like Israel, gone back to restart something, to build something where they can worship their God. Um, can they, will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are, to buy the Ammonite? who was at his side said what are they building even a fox climbing up on it would break down that their wall of stones hear us O god for we are despised turn the insults back on their own heads give them over as plunder in the land of captivity you see when you get something burning in your heart in god instantly there's an enemy there's no enemy i think well what you have is that really of god but when when there's an enemy having a go at you personally when you're trying to rebuild your life or when church leadership is trying to move on but, but there's blockages, there's obstacles, that's a great thing because the enemy is angry, the enemy is stirred up and that's the way it is. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height For the people worked with all their heart. You know, many people have worked in this place with all their hearts and more. Double hearts. Years ago to get this place where it is today. But now we have a a younger leadership. Yes, Tim is younger than me. And um, Cass and others. And uh, God has a plan for the same heart, the same spirit to be poured in for the advancement of his kingdom through this church there's a problem though the problem is the halfway point and that's what Israel found they got halfway and suddenly the climate changed it's like halfway was almost good enough now if you look around the congregation today just have a look at each other that's pretty good isn't it yep yep most seats are filled now I'd like everyone to do a little experiment could you all stand up And about turn and look slightly up. (laughs) We have one guy in distress up there because he's embarrassed. (laughs) 
And one man up in the heavenlies, he's smiling and doing a good job on the screen. But church, is this halfway good enough? You look at our congregation, you can sit down. You look down here and you think, oh yeah, we're pretty full today. Last week it was even fuller. But hang on, it was also emptier. Is it half full or half empty? I don't know. But there's something about reaching halfway. Halfway is a challenge to us. Intimidation comes. When you try and move on past that halfway point, the enemy will try and intimidate. This is one of the chief things that the enemy uses to bring you down, to crush you. He'll use family members. He'll use the words of your father when you were a child. You'll never amount to anything. He'll use the press. He'll use the media. He'll use workmates in the lunchroom when the name of Jesus is mentioned or the Safe Schools Program or Islam or whatever. You raise an issue. Suddenly you find, whoa, there's an angry enemy out there ready to pounce. And keep the Christian, the gospel, the church, the message, the Bible, to keep it all suppressed, intimidated, where they want it. Ineffective and not passing the halfway line. Intimidation has been used on God's saints all through the Bible. Joshua marching around Jericho. What were they shouting at him from the top of the walls? Oh, you know, you little pipsqueaks down there. David and Goliath. What? A kid? The armour doesn't even fit him. Don't send him out there. And Goliath said, I'll feed him to the birds. <clears throat> Intimidation. Didn't stop them. Moses got to the Red Sea with all of Israel. And Pharaoh's hot on his tail. He could have said, okay, guys, raise your hands and walk up to Pharaoh. Let's give ourselves up and let's go back to where we were. That halfway point's pretty good. At least we're fed and watered and have a roof over our head. Noah building the ark. Intimidation. People laughed and sneered at him for a hundred years. I don't know if I'd survive that. Jesus and the devil tried to tempt him. You can have all this, you know, intimidation. If anything you have in your spirit as a church, as a leadership, if anything in, is in your spirit and it's good and it's of God, the sandballot spirit will be there to greet you. And its first job is to put you down and clip you down to size. Secondly, about those verses, the enemy is highly organised. The enemy in the wall. The Israelites were trying to rebuild a broken down wall. When I was in PNG in 1988 or 9, I can't remember which, um, I stayed in Pastor Number Puri's hut in Western Highlands in a village called Mala, which means kangaroo, doesn't it, Sandra? Yeah, anyway, that was New Guinea word for the village. And um, at night, we're woken up by a disturbance in the wall. And halfway down the wall was a big hole in it. And there was a great screaming and things were bashing around because the walls were hollow, made of like woven bab bamboo or something. And uh, pit pit, yeah, some words like that. And what it was, it was the rats in the wall. And Number, Pastor Number, would always set one dirty big rat trap that he had down the bottom below the hole. And the rats showed me that they, the enemy, are highly organised. It's like when you cast demons out of people sometimes. You soon hear, man, there's a lot of them and, and they're organised and there's ranks and files and serial numbers and there's the cows, there's the strong ones, there's the ones in charge. And so the rats were fighting and I said to Number, uh, because it... 3 a.m. there was a big bang and then there was silence and the rats ran out to do their hunting for the night and I said to Number what was that about he said oh the rats go and ask the king, king rat um, what they're going to do about getting out without getting caught on the trap they can't send the king or they don't send the generals they just so they pick out a coward and throw him on the trap and when the trap goes off they think that's it boys let's go out for the night so the enemy is like that Sanballat was like that. He could call up any recruits he wanted. There are always people available, ready to join forces, to sneer at you, to intimidate you because of God's heart, God's plan for your life, God's plan for this church. <clears throat> you know? So, thirdly, the power in prayer, declaration and intersection. Uh, <laughs> sorry, intercession. 
<clears throat> John 20, 23 says, if you, this is an incredible verse, we actually have authority to say who's in heaven, who's out. Did you realise that? And um, Nehemiah used that. He said, uh, in John 20, 23, Jesus said, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. They are powerful words. Be careful how you pray about your enemies. You might lose someone next door. <laughs> or your spouse, or no. <laughs> Jono um, Inarua has been, or oh, he shared with me recently a story in Jacko where Jono set up a base for Africa Front Air Missions. Um, they went through about a year of ferocious opposition from witchcraft. Now, witchcraft are not little things you do in kindergarten dressing up with big black hats and in Australia. Witchcraft is full on serious, demonic, devilish opposition. And it's very powerful. And um, they were experiencing all sorts of bizarre things in the, in the house, in their base. And every time they tried to advance, it's like the enemy just had the game sewn up. And all of Jacko, everyone was on the side. The Catholics, the Church of Uganda, the, uh, the, the general population, the widows, and all from the power of the witches there. And there were so many witches in Jacko. So they went to war with it. They went to prayer like Nehemiah did. And they prayed and they fought in the spirit. And several times on a night when they fought, they knew something powerful happened. And sure enough, next morning through the guard, the night guard, a message came. Oh, you know that powerful witch just over there who's been opposing us? He died last night. And it happened again and again and again, several times. Until today, there's only two witches left. And they have the mickey taken out of them. They, they have no power. So as believers in God, like Nehemiah, when we're opposed, when we're intimidated, we can stand up and we can declare things. We can speak things into being. We can pray with great authority. Luke 10, 19, give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm you. That's great authority. Amen? Okay, let's... Um, next batch of scriptures. Halfway, being halfway, church, is the enemy of going all the way with God. Halfway is the enemy of all the way. Are we getting that? It's like good is the enemy of being the best. And so... What the Israelites did, they got halfway and they thought, oh, it looks pretty good. Oh, a few patches down there, but this part's great. You know? Let's read the verses, see what happens. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. The people worked with all their heart. There was nothing wrong with their heart, but their vision had blinkers on for halfway. When San Ballot Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Vegemites, the Marmites, and Ashdod. You see, the devil can summon up whoever he wants. Not hard for him to get followers. You, in the lunchroom or at university or in the workplace, you, you can be very alone. You won't rally anyone except God, the Holy Spirit, and God, the Father, and the Spirit of Christ. I guess that's enough. But the devil can rally troops in the flesh whenever he wants to intimidate. They all plotted... <clears throat> Oh yeah, they heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. Have you sensed in Australia, folks, that there's an anger against the church just below the surface? Have you noticed that? Just simmering, you raise issues with certain people and suddenly they're so angry. And you think, well, I love you, but where did that come from? And so this is what Nehemiah found. This is the sand ballot spirit. It doesn't like, it likes the church as a high steeple, no people sort of building, historical, nice thing on the, no car parks, on the corner, as long as it doesn't do too much or get too excited. That's where the devil, that's where the world wants the church. They don't want to eradicate it, they just want it in control in case revival breaks up, like Pastor Bill was talking about. But we prayed. 
Oh, they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Verse 9, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble we cannot rebuild the wall. So the goodies are starting to doubt whether the next half is actually worth looking at. Is it actually possible? Why don't we just settle with this half and... You know, maybe go back to Persia for a bit of a good feed and come back occasionally for holidays or something. Halfway was good enough, maybe. Meanwhile, the, uh, no, verse 11. Also the enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. You see how the devil works, folks? When something gets really on fire in God, the devil, if he can't destroy it from the outside, he'll come and work from the inside. The devil will come in as a wolf in sheep's clothing and there will be division disunity people say to me oh, Bill how come you Ray and Dave and how come the church worked you know when we started this church a Pentecostal pastor of quite renown in the western suburbs of Adelaide said Christian families oh they, they won't amount to anything when we started this building here that they, they won't amount to anything they won't pull it off well in about three years our church was nearly twice as big as his and things were going great so um when the when i'm asked what what's the key to success i really believe it was unity at the senior leadership level great power and unity in unity god imparts his blessing and his spirit it says in psalms that's a great key unlike the enemy in the wall and those rats, they soon turn on each other when it comes to the crunch. Verse 12, the Jews who lived, are the Jews, these must be the really good guys. The Jews who lived near and told us 10 times over, they must have had a hearing problem like me, wherever you turn, they'll be there to attack us. <clears throat> Hang on, I thought you guys were on our side. You know... <clears throat> So, yeah, I won't go into that one. Therefore, 13. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families. There's great power in Godly Families Church. This church was called the Christian Family Centre. God puts the lonely in families so that you can be invisibly linked one to another. When Norma and I started appearing here at this church after 20 years, of being migrating here, there and everywhere, people came up to us. I couldn't even remember their names and they're all hugging and nearly crying. I think, whoa, we've come home. God puts the lonely in families. The church, this is Christian family centre. If you've got a lousy family, earthly, or no family, don't worry about it. Here's the family. Here it is sitting next to you. Verse 13, then I stationed the people, yeah, the lowest points, families. Verse 14, after I looked things over, I stood up, Nehemiah said, and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. You know, fear has torment, the Bible says. Leo Harris used to hammer this so often. Fear has torment because most people who suffered fear in the Lord were exposed and vulnerable to the demonic oppression. Fear opens a door to it. We have to deal with fear in our personal lives, in our church lives, in our society. Where will church be in Australia in 50 years? Will the church ever be persecuted in this country? One thing is for sure, we must not fear. We not, must not be afraid. We must value, love, respect, honour each other and stand arm in arm together, side by side in what God has called us to do. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and uh, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Love it, Tim, when you said love your son. What a lucky boy to grow up with a father publicly disclosing that. Some of you have grown up with the opposite. Your fathers thought you were just a nitwit, a nuisance, never amount to anything. It's been verbalised with some of you. That's intimidation. That, that is a curse. 
But you in the Lord have the power to reverse that curse. Be careful how strongly you reverse it. If the cursor is still alive <laughs> and you don't want them dead. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Australia, not Africa. It's okay. Okay, next point here. Halfway is really no way. Now, I wasn't real good at maths in school. I went to Goodwood Primary School in 19, I don't know what, 50-something. Westbourne Park Primary in grade 6 and 7. Unley High following that until I was 16 and had enough and went jack rooing. And maths didn't really agree with me. Nor did science or English or chemistry or physics. <laughs> but maths was intriguing because I could never work out. The teacher would say plus and a plus is a positive. I thought, yeah, brilliant stuff. Did I have to come here to learn that? Then he said a plus and a negative is a negative. And then he really messed it up by saying a negative and a negative is a positive. I didn't get that bit. But a plus, church, and a negative. I thought of you guys. We got you to stand and look up there. To me, down here is a plus. What a great church. Up there, there's a minus. People. There's a minus of people. It actually is a negative. Why is it a negative? Because it should be a positive. It can be a positive. When we had 130, 40 kids above the kitchen in the activities room when Nikki was about this high, like knee high Maya, and Laura, and Melissa, little kids jammed in there. Uh, we, we had such a great time up there. What was I going to say? <laughs> oh, yeah. The room was jam-packed. I love it when rooms are jam-packed. <clears throat> Somehow there's an anointing in a room that's packed. So we're halfway. We are half-packed or half-not-packed. I'm not sure. We're halfway there. And I think as a church, we have so many positives. We have so many pluses. But we still have some vacuums. We have some vacuums to fill. One day you should do a service, Tim, where everybody's banned from this level. They have to go up there. And they have to look down and listen to you preach and worship while Laura's leaning and all this and look over all these empty seats. And then they need to pray, God, for my neighbour. Lord, Saturday night, I could, have in the, I could have talked to that person about Jesus, but I held back. You know? And pray people into the seats. Oh, but... Pastor Bill, we've planted so many churches right across Australia, the Christian Family Centre. Yeah. But I tell you what, if mum's not big and fat and strong, the kids are going to start to suffer a little bit. They need a role model. They need an example. They need a place that is packed. I loved Crusade Hall in 1970s whenever we went there. 700 people jammed into a place. And you'd sit there on these old wooden chairs, which I'd hate to try it now, and uh, the danger was you lift your hands in worship, you couldn't get them down again. <laughs> the gap was taken by the person next door, especially if they were big and large. So, but the anointing, Bill Harris, one piano, that was a music team. One piano, no amps. And the greatest instrument in that place was a human voice. And I believe in harmony harmonised voices in song and worship, that's where the anointing is. And we need to hear that. It was great, Laura, today. Maybe it's because I was down the front. I could hear the people singing. Passionate worship. Well done, guys. Fantastic. That's where the anointing is. We were saved on that. The kids in the activity room up there, the old sunshine is in that. We had such anointed times of worship there. So anointed. Sometimes we'd sing. The kids have got their eyes closed. I'd finish the song playing the guitar and think, what's next? And the kids are still there. So I'd just wait. And sometimes I'd wait. It seemed like, well, it was quite a while because the anointing just lingered. And we loved that. And we reproduced that in our shearing shed at Broken Gum in the camps, the days of the camps. Didn't we, Alan and Jill and others who helped us out there? God turns up when people are passionate. And when they have a sense of tight togetherness. So Downstairs Upstairs was a TV show, wasn't it? 
Upstairs, downstairs. Yeah, you see, well, let's start with the upstairs. Make it a God, let's fill it. This home base needs to be bursting. And dare I say it, you fill that, you're still only halfway. You know why? See that wall there? It's temporary. It's designed to be removed. The portals in this roof go that way. You could take it out, nothing will fall down, God willing. <laughs> I told the first service when they poured this balcony, the, the scaffolding lurched and everyone ran for their lives. And I did not lurch. I thought, where, where are they going? Is it smoke or something? <laughs> You have a lawn out there, church, because that lawn is designed to take a building and this, this whole thing is meant to go round. So it's good to be only halfway as long as we keep motivated and realise there's more to do. There's always more to do in God. More churches to plant, more activity in the spirit. Um, at Hills Family Church at Nairn, we, we um, what time am I meant to finish, Tim? Don't say five minutes ago. <laughs> okay. We did a thing called Way of the Master. Now, it's a bit strict and baptist and you know. But gee, it worked. We taught them how to go out, witness in the streets, <clears throat> and you get people saved all over the place. And we did it. And Joel Vasos, Pastor Jim Vasos' son, was so excited about it. He went out in the car park one day, and this guy was coming across the car park. They used to cut through our car park, walking down to the shops. And Joel thought, right, I've got him. So he went up, did way of the master on him, led him to Christ, born again. He started coming to church. Then he moved to Port Lincoln and we heard he's in that church. And Joel was so excited as a 15, 16-year-old. Do you know what? These guys won't really get stirred up until they see that God is alive. He is supernatural. He is miraculous. And souls are getting saved. The family is having a growth problem. That's what really makes church exciting. You want your family, your children, and when they grow up, and believe me, it happens quick, their children, excited about church. My children grew up. Man, we, oh, what did we do? How did we do it all, Norma? We had outreach clubs. We started with Joy Time Bible Club. Isn't that a wonderful modern name? <laughs> but kids loved it. And we did another cut club. Where's Mick Hutchfield? I don't know. I think it was at King's Kids. Okay, yeah, he's one spit noise struck. So, North Haven Primary School, a club there. Taparoo Primary School, Semaphore South Primary School, Fuller North Primary School. We reached kids, all, we had clubs going. We were reaching hundreds of kids every week. We couldn't get them to come here. In fact, in the early days, we didn't have here. This happened in 1986. We were doing all this before. Our little house at Henley Beach, we had at least three meetings where people were getting born again every week in our, in our house. Our kids grew up with it. Did it turn them off? Did it make them bitter? No. They just wanted more and more of it. And friendships were formed. And when this church opened, a lot of the older ones in our Sunshine group up to year nine, they, they, they came here. Some of them, like Ron Hammond, was, was reached in Taparoo. And... Um, he once was that high. Can you believe that? Those of you that know him, <laughs> Ronald. So we have to get back, church, and if they don't come to us, let's go to them. Jesus said, go out to the highways and the byways, and he didn't say, invite them, form a friendship, buy them a chocolate, and then leave a little leaflet. No, he said, make them come in. Why? Because you're excited about what God is doing here. The place is good, not bad. It's friendly, not unfriendly. The cappuccinos are really good, not awful. And the youth are so handsome. Look at them. <laughs> well, except those that are beautiful. <laughs> so make them – somehow we've got to get – there's a world out there. We should sit up there in the service and look down and think, now who? Wow, that seat, that seat, the people. The other way to reach people is treasure hunting. Some of you may have heard of it. That's where you – Pray in the Spirit and let God give you a vision of someone or something, a shirt or a shop or a place or a street, and then go out, find the people the Holy Spirit has said, lead them to the Lord, and then lead them to the Lord. I remember Jono and a team were praying and they, they had in their mind, is Jono here today? I don't know. Is he? Oh dear, I'd be careful what I say. 
Sorry, John. Where is he? Hiding. Oh, yeah. And they, they had a picture of three bl- black people and they went down the Adelaide race, Railway Station and there's three Sudanese. I think they were Sudanese. Kenyan, still black. <laughs> Not as black as Sudanese though. And they were there. And so they went up. They witnesses. They led them to the Lord. One had a crook ankle. They prayed for his ankle. It was healed. And they had a great time. That's called treasure hunting. But what do we do with youth today? Oh, we've got to entertain them and have fun and do this and throw them lollies. And come on, church. We've got Jesus. Let's spread it like peanut paste on toast. Let's get it out there because the world actually wants it. If they don't want that, they can go anywhere and get it. Okay? Only the church can offer the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. Only the church can do that. And I'm going over time as usual. I won't do those two points. Let's just finish off here. The next set of verses. Thank you, Mr. Up Top Man. You're a sucker. Everybody say amen. (laughs) No, you won't. You're a sucker, not a cutting. Now... I'm not very good at gardening, as you can, well, come home, you'll see why. But I know that a sucker, there's the the mother tree, and it sends out under the ground roots or something, and then the suckers come up. And when you pull the suckers up, you think, that's got rid of that. You turn around, there's another one that's come up behind you. And, And they're all around, you can't get rid of them. Why not? Because they are linked to the mother plant, and there's a lifeline of sustenance and nutrients. Whereas a cutting... You snip it, take it somewhere, stick it in, it's on its own. Now, Nehemiah arrived at a point where he had to do something about the people who were way down the wall, all the low bits and around the corners and out of sight. They were down there, but somehow he wanted them linked. It's very important to stay linked, church, to stay connected to family, even if you're far apart. I won't read those verses because... We're basically short of time here, but Nehemiah was with it and and he made sure that those farthest out were still part of what were kept safe, were growing. And when they played the trumpet, when Pastor Bill V says, come on CFC Church's leadership, we need to get together. They come, they hear the trumpet, they come and there is the connection is reinforced, it is strengthened, it's made strong. We are not cuttings out there to just shrivel up in the sun and the drought. We can draw strength from the body as the faithful followers did for the rebuilding of the wall. They continued the work against all odds. The enemy within, the enemy without. Intimidation, overcoming fears. But they prayed, they declared, and they recognised who they were in God and moved on. Um, Can we have the next one, please? The first picture one. I want to show a picture here. This this is in uh, our latest school. We've just, I'd never said I'd start any more schools in Africa, but we did. It's one of my weaknesses. (laughs) And it's way, Bwikaraji it is. And... um, Actually, a family sent a little church outreach at Manham is funding this one, is supporting this school. And the guy there, the pastor, does not have a word of English. Absolute poverty. Kids are doing classes under trees, under poles with tarpaulins flapping around in the wind. And I thought, oh my goodness. But when I saw this guy, I realised, here's a guy like Nehemiah's wall. This guy's building something and he's armed and he's dangerous. And he's got his sword. It's a bit worn out. The pages are all hanging out. The edges are all worn. And I love his name. And it's true because his name is Emmanuel. Pastor Emmanuel, God is with us. And he knows that God is with him. And all he did was carry his sword around and smile the whole four days we were there. And I thought, this is good. And those kids look at him. They look at his Bible. There's the role model. They know where their hope is. They know where their strength is. And... Emmanuel is very much on the front line of what is happening there. You know, church, today, some of you in your lives, the devil's had a go. Life has taken its toll. Maybe in your 
areas of leadership. You've attempted things, strategies, you've prayed, you've got to, you've done, and it hasn't really hit the mark. Next one, thank you. Then let me finish up with this picture. This is two boys in the Congo, in Bunia. They're looking at the dead body of their mother at her burial. They lost the father three years ago, and now mother has died, I think of AIDS. And it shows the heartbreak, and I think those boys, my first thought, they're like cuttings. They're, they're stuck out there. Man, there's no connection. The Australian government, uh, the Congolese government won't give us visas to get in to our project currently because they think there could be another war outbreak at the end of the year, thanks to a naughty president once again. And I think, oh, what can we do? Then I got an email saying, these boys are sponsored. Heather, you sponsor one of these boys. And the other one is by a guy called Ricky who lost his daughter from Strathalban. You might have heard of Layla, Layla's lifeline, little girl who died after falling off a swing. Two people who have suffered grief and loss are connected invisibly by a lifeline to somebody who's suffering grief and loss. And I think, God, you're going to use this link. And if I talk to Arnie Heather, she's going to write a letter. And she's going to say, I know what you boys are going through. I've been through the same. And how God has helped me, God is going to help you. There's no distance in the connection that God can give. As Nehemiah built the wall, it didn't matter how far down it was. They, the ones that were faithful to the very end, to see the thing up all the way, not stopping half the way. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, and I believe in this place, a really good work has begun. You know, when I worked here on staff with Bill Vazlakis, I may, I may as well have worked with, with Joe Blow or Father Christmas because we really cross paths some week, especially when the building was going up, the kids work. For 20 years, I spent pretty well every Sunday out with the kids. But I knew it didn't have to be spoken or documented or minuted that Bill was here. Everything in the church is in order. And he knew that the bits I was doing, everything was in order. He never questioned it. He never worried about it. Well, I don't think he did. And it just happened because of the team that we were and because of what God had started. We were so sure this was God. It was a miracle we got this land, five acres I remember looking at land, little blocks about one acre for five times the price. We got this land. And I nearly joined those Jews who said, Bill, I'm not sure. I think, man, oh, this is... But I shut up because I knew that God was growing our church in Ray's shed, in the Seton Scout Hall with the smell of empty beer bottles, with West Beach Primary School, with Grange School, and then to hear God was on a roll. All we had to do was run and keep up with him. And in those years, the church grew from 15 to 50% a year. So it made a few nightmares where to put everyone, especially the kids. We used to have kids meeting under the stairs there, in the kitchen, in Pastor Bill's office. Wherever there was a table chair, a bit of empty floor, God was doing his stuff. And he was doing it in the children, in the youth, in the senior people. So church, we are a family. Amen. Let's appreciate it. Let's enjoy it. Let's value it. And if your life, if your life, you feel, you get up on a Monday morning, you look in the mirror and you see a pile of burnt rocks. You see the wall is broken down. And you hear the voices that people have said to you. Oh, you're no good. You're this. You'll never achieve. You'll never be that. See, you feel that Sam Ballot spirit coming on you. You rebuke that mirror. Rebuke the face in it. Tell yourself off. My wife does. <laughs> She's good at declaring things. And she said, no, I will not suffer cancer in Jesus' name and blah, blah, blah. We move ahead in what God has done and provided. You've got to fight for it, church. We fought in the old days and you have to fight now. To see that place, for, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to get out on the front line. You're going to have to get your hands dirty. You're going to have to be... Laughed at, rebuked, teased, intimidated. 
Feel the oppression of the enemy. That's all good because that means you're on the right track. Amen? So God bless you. I'm going to hand.